So um, we are the mouse cohort, um, and you might be really wondering right now how mice fit into um, talking about mosquitoes, but also talking about agriculture, um, but we will get there in just a bit. Um, so we were the 2013 cohort. We started out as six students from a variety um, of different disciplines. Um, Dr. Pitts, who's next to me here, um, was in rhetoric and digital media, so in the communication aspect. Um, we have Greg Backus, who's now doing a postdoc at UC Davis in biomathematics. Uh, Renee Valdez in forestry and environmental resources, who just took a position, um, and I'm happy to announce this. He sent this via email just a little bit ago um, over in Virginia um, in the fish and game department looking at social um, issues as well. Um, and then Carolyn Lightshoe, who's over there, and myself um, are part of the biology aspect. So ours was the case of transgenic mice, 2013 island biodiversity. So if you look here, it's a gorgeous picture. And I'm going to take a page from Fred here and ask you a question some of you might have heard before. Um, and that's, does this look different to you if you knew that this was also the home to some of the most invasive mice in all of the world and some of the most plentiful area of mice in all of the world? And then I'm also going to ask you, would it look different if you knew that there was genetically engineered mice on this island? Now there's not, um, but I just wanted to kind of get that started here. So this is the Farallon Islands, one of our model cases that we've been looking at because they have such high mouse densities. And we also visited this um, when we took our trip to California and the islands. So why are we talking about mice on islands? Over 80% of the islands globally have invasive rodents, so mice or rats, and they're actually a huge problem. We oftentimes don't think of one mouse being a problem, but on the Farallons that I just showed you that gorgeous picture of, they have over 500 mice per hectare. That's a lot of mice. That's like the ground is crawling. So if they are consuming and causing a problem here, well, what kinds of impacts do they have? Well, it's mostly to native seabirds. So they threaten the native seabird populations. They will consume their eggs, their chicks. Um, they will even chew on adult mice, and it's pretty gruesome. So we were tasked with the idea of, well, how do you get rid of these? Well, actually, ongoing, this has been a long-term problem. For many islands, what they do is they drop rodenticide. So these rodent eradications have been occurring for about 30 years now. And the traditional method of rodenticide um, is deployed where they airily broadcast this rodenticide-laced bait. It does have a higher failure rate for mice as opposed to rats. It's not generally good to apply a pesticide where there's people, right? So where there's lots of inhabitants. There are direct off-target effects. So those very seabirds that are precious that you're trying to protect might accidentally consume the bait or something else. Um, but it has been very successful for these smaller islands, but it also might be reaching the limits of its technology as we look at some of these islands and as we increase in scope. So this mouse cohort, why we are a mouse cohort, is we were tasked with what does genetic engineering have to offer invasive rodents on islands? So one, could and should this be an alternative to pesticides? What costs and regulations would be associated with such a technique? And really, what are the social and ethical implications of releasing a transgenic mouse on an island if this were to happen? So back in the summer of 2013, which, as some of the other cohort members have said, seems like a long time ago now. Um, but back then, we were sent out to California. We'd known each other for about a week by this point. Um, and we were bunking in all different kinds of places, um, Catalina Island, Santa Cruz Island, the Bay Area, um, where we also took a tour of those gorgeous Farallon Islands. And we started really talking about the socialist aspects of islands and also what happens when you try to do an eradication on islands. So we came back here and we were W welcomed, I, um, definitely, by a host of different genetic engineering society faculty from a whole suite of disciplines. So you've already kind of seen some listed before. Um, but I would say that each and every person um, who really kind of welcomed us back and kind of led us on this task of how do we work together as a team and kind of forming these thoughts about rodent eradications on islands. 
So how do you fuse the disciplines? So one, I'd say you have to really communicate your field effectively. And it's learning to speak the same language. And I'm going to go off of what Nora and I were kind of as a group, as a table eight talking about earlier, that it's not necessarily about learning to speak someone else's language all the time. It's learning just to speak the common language of English, right? Um, and that we get so caught up in our jargon, right? And so removing that jargon, communicating directly what you mean, and being very effective. Um, at the same time, you really have to understand the different perspectives that people have. We um, participated as members as part of another IGERD project, which was the Responsible Innovation um, with Jennifer Kuzma leading. And so we um, have learned to try um, to our best to do this responsible innovation. Um, and then one of the harder things is how do you share unique viewpoints collectively? Right? And so we decided to do this um, all while working at the same time as graduate students. So this is really complex. These are complex questions. You're talking about complex ideas and complex people, right? So you have multiple perspectives. You have different goals. You have difficult technologies. So there is no such thing as a genetically modified mouse that's ready to be released on an island, right? This is still being created. This is still being formed. Um, you have unique merging of disciplines. You have to inform your, as we now know, publics, right? So we're no longer talking public. Um, I actually am going to credit Jason Delborn for that, um, that I now speak about publics. Um, and then, of course, all at the same time, we need to complete our independent dissertations. So what has come of this? So as a cohort, we decided that we wanted to share our unique yet collective visions with a website. So our goal, and we ended up designing this for open-minded skeptics with agency. Um, so what does that mean? That means someone who might be tasked with looking into this kind of project, who's maybe a wildlife manager, maybe someone who's interested um, in seeing what kind of technologies are developing. So here we explore the use and impacts that these mice may have on not only wild mouse populations, but ecosystems and human society. We've been wrestling with ideas for a really long time. Um, and so it started to kind of be interesting to look back and when I was asked to give this presentation, to think about really how far we've come and the different angles that we've all taken looking at this project. So we have some people who focused on ecological modeling and efficiency. We've looked at perceptions in the news media and framing of rodents, animal rights and technology. We've looked at developing these gene drives. Um, and what does this mean in terms of ecological impacts? So we have been very busy. Besides our great website, we've also designed other cohort products. So in the Journal of Responsible Innovation, we have our Light Shoe et al. article. We have also have several conferences that we've presented at jointly with a range of disciplines. So in-group, Interdisciplinary Network for Group Research Conference, the ISSRM, International Symposium Society of Resource Management, the Atlanta Conference on Science and Innovation, and the Wildlife Society. So just a little bit about me personally. I come from an education background in teaching. I'm a former high school teacher. Um, and what I think about with IGERT is it's really helped me expand my teaching ability. Um, coming from a high school setting, you're very siloed. I taught biology. In fact, there was a year I taught six periods of biology. <laughs> that was my day. Um, and I remember reaching out to a mathematician once, um, a mathematics teacher, and saying, like, hey, could we do like this kind of like interdisciplinary like merging? That was my idea of interdisciplinary then. And they're like, no. I mean, it was just a flat out no, I don't have time for it. Um, coming from an education background, I can definitely understand. But at the same time, I was really excited to join Iger because it helped me expand my interdisciplinary aspect. So um, I have designed and co-taught a course with Elizabeth Pitts, who's next to me here, on the ethics of biotechnical communication that she'll talk about more in just a little bit. Um, and recently, I designed and taught a course on conservation on islands. Um, and I could not have done that without IGERT. Many of you in the room were guest lectures, and I thank you, and I appreciate that, um, where you came from a whole host of disciplines talking about these different aspects. Finally, there's someone in the room who doesn't always get mentioned that I want to get credit to, um, and that is Dr. John Godwin, who's in the corner there. He's a professor of biological sciences in the College of Science. He's credited with a lot of this project idea and formation. 
He has served on all of the mouse cohorts um, committees and is two of our primary PIs, me and Carolyn's. Um, he literally has blood, sweat, and tears probably um, from building these enclosures where the island mice are now maintained. So we have some of those Fairland Island mice. Um, and he received that Federal Defense Safe Genes funding to continue exploring the project from interdisciplinary perspectives. So that is what I have is introducing our mouse cohort. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Elizabeth in a little bit. <laughs> 